Good evening, everybody, and uh, such a great turnout. I'm absolutely honoured. So today I'm um, going to talk about the update that we did for the Serio Guide C580. Um, the talk is basically split into two parts. In the first part, I'll talk about setting the scene, giving a background to the update, and I'll talk you through a little bit of the process that Serio follows when updating uh, or producing the guides. Um, go through a little bit of the industry feedback that we received when we were doing the, uh, the update of the document and then from that industry feedback the areas of the existing document that required updating. And then once we've set the scene I want to go into a bit more detail in the second part about the document itself. If uh, I'm sure you've all seen it by now I hope and it's quite a mighty tome so there's no chance of going through uh, every part of it but I've picked two key elements of the document. One which is design of embedded retaining walls by calculation, which is of course the, the normal way that we do retaining wall design in accordance with EC7. Um, and second of all, design by observational method, which is in accordance with EC7, but not often we found um, used. And so one of the things we wanted to do in the update was bring the observational method to the forefront. And then I'll just touch on some of the other things I think are significant developments in the document. So. Starting with uh, the background to the update, I just uh, want to take you back to 2003, uh, 17 years ago now. This man here was winning the fifth of his seven Tour de France's. Don't know what happened to him. Salam Hussein was found in a hiding in a foxhole in his hometown of Tikrit after the invasion of Iraq. Concorde flew its uh, final flight. C580 was published, that's what I was getting to. Uh, and it was called the Embedded Retaining Walls Guidance for in, uh, Economic Design. And the emphasis was on the word economic and it was funded by the, the DTI, the Department for Trade and Industry, to encourage economic design and reduce cost of construction. And by the time we started updating this, it had sold 600, over 600 hard copies. And at that time, over 33,500 downloads from IHS. I know they're not individual because I'm at least responsible for 10 of them, but uh, that's quite an impressive number and a wide used, widely used document. Going back a little bit further than 2003, what is the background to use of codes of practice for designing retaining walls, in the UK at least? Um, the first one published was a CP2, Code of Practice 2, published in uh, 1951. And it was issued by the Joint Engineering Codes of Practice Joint Committee. And because of the technology at the time, it didn't really uncover embedded walls, only briefly touched on uh, sheet par walls, but was mainly aimed at uh, gravity retaining walls. Then, sometime later, 33 years later, R104, Report 104, was published by Syria, and this was uh, written by Padfield and Mayer, Lord Sir Robert Mayer, and it's highly influential, um, but it was targeted at stiff clays and of course stiff clays in the UK given the economic fulcrum of the country is basically London clay. Uh, I didn't say as such but it was basically targeting London clay um, and it didn't give one method of design it was basically a summary of all the different approaches that were available at the time. Then BS 8002 was published in the, the mid 1990s and it included for example some useful references for deriving unit weight from materials typical friction angles and things like that, which were useful in uh, design. And then in 2003 came along C580. Um, as I mentioned, it was funded by the Department for Trade and Industry, and it gave three design approaches. Um, a and B were essentially partial factors applied to um, material properties, depending on if they were your representative parameters or your worst credible and then approach C was essentially the observational method and it covered competent ground so and it described competent ground as stiff clays and dense granular material but again a very southeast England focus for for the materials covered. Now it's rather unfortunate timing because in 2004 Eurocode 7 was published uh, BSEN 1997 in the UK and it replaced BS8002 as the code of practice for, retaining, for designing embedded retaining walls. And it um, drew on a lot of the, uh, the approach used in C580, but fundamentally C580 wasn't in accordance with Eurocode 7. 
because it came literally one or two years beforehand. And in the UK, at least, we have design, we've adopted design approach one, which requires two checks. I understand Ireland's very accommodating and you can use design approach one, two, or three, but I understand that uh, design approach one is most commonly used for embedded retaining walls. And approach one requires two checks. Now, in a rather unexpected move uh, for the industry, BS8002 was republished in 2015, even though it had been withdrawn and replaced by EC7, um, and funded by HS2, the high speed, second high-speed railway in the UK. And it was republished to bring it in line with EC7, but what it did was it brought back some of that useful information that uh, the old BS had and, uh, and was felt to be uh, lost in the Eurocode 7 uh, publications. So at this point, I have to tell you who paid for you, uh, the update. Syria is, of course, a non-profit uh, or organization, essentially a charity um, run for the benefit of the, of the industry. It doesn't uh, generate any of its own income other than through the sale of its guides. So you can see the, uh, the funders are a good mix of uh, client organizations, Highways England, the Environment Agency, London Underground, uh, main contractors, Balfour Beatty, Langer Rourke, and um, Bashi Solitons, as well as some specialist contractors, such as ArcelorMittal for sheet piles and Ground Force for sort of prefabricated uh, props. But the, the whole project would not have got off the ground if it wasn't for HS2. They funded the lion's share of the money required to uh, pay for the update. And they saw this as an opportunity for a guidance document to be produced, which would essentially be the design guidance for HS2 retaining walls. And this is the team that uh, produced the report. From Marup, it was led by uh, Asim Gaba, who was one of the authors on the C580 document, myself and Lauren Doughty. And then from a contra uh, contractor point of view, we had Demetrius Salamitis from Cementation Skanska, and then also carried over from C580 days from an academic point of view was Professor William Powery from uh, Southampton. So I'll talk a little bit now about the process you go through when you're writing a, a Syria guidance. Of course we were approached by Syria to do the document. It's a, it's a contract, you're a research contractor and you get approached and you make a proposal. And to give you an idea how long the process takes, our proposal to undertake this work was submitted in February 2013, seven, seven years ago. When the money from essentially HS2 was uh, secured, we then started the research work. And the first thing we did, because it's Syria is a, a research body for the benefit of the industry, most of, we don't want it to be an academic piece of work with our views, we wanted it to represent the industry views. The first task was to get that industry view. And, and we issued a uh, series of questionnaires, and these were distributed to the uh, British Geotechnical Association, and to the Institution of Civil Engineers mailing list to anybody who registered an interest in ground engineering. So that's several thousand people, as you imagine, in the UK. And then, uh, just a few days later, we hosted a workshop in the Arab office of 50 invited experts that included ranking lecturers and professors and various other distinguished people to get their feedback as well so we could uh, consolidate with the, the broader industry view. Once we'd got if you like the input from the industry, what they wanted to see in the document, we then go through a series of um, workshops with something that Syria put together, which is called the Project Steering Group. And it's a sequence then of meetings, submitting drafts, getting comments, updating, and then going through the whole loop again. And we went through that loop six times with uh, the Project Steering Group. Again, the, the Project Steering Group is an invited panel of experts, interested experts, who uh, keep us in line, essentially. And then by June 2014, um, we had uh, completed the first draft. Um, by January 2016, the document was completed essentially and went for independent review by, again, an, uh, an independent expert not involved in the drafting process to give one final check over everything. And then dissemination started between October and February 2016, and then final publication was February 2017. So the whole process from beginning to end is about four years, including drafting and uh, proposals and whatnot. So what was the industry feedback? As I said, we had a questionnaire which was issued as broadly as possible to the industry um, and also an industry workshop. 
These are just some uh, snippets that we get from the, uh, the questionnaire. It was distributed internationally to anybody in, in the database. We had over 260 responses from 17 different countries. Um, and interestingly, if you look at this uh, map at the, at the bottom here, this shows one of the questions was where have you used C580 for design? And you can see that it's covering quite a large part of the globe and in some quite unexpected areas where you essentially wouldn't expect Syria or UK influence uh, to be like Brazil and, uh, and China. But you can see it's quite widely used. And one of the questions we asked was, what additional things would you like to see in the document? And which, because we didn't want the document to continue getting bigger and bigger, we also asked which bits could we lose from the existing document. And unfortunately, every single chapter, including the part on construction design and management, essentially health and safety, was viewed as equally as important as each other. So we didn't feel we could actually cut any chapter from the document. But the most common suggestions were it had to be Eurocode compliant. As I said earlier, C580 missed the Eurocode by just a couple of years, but was instrumental in its formation. Um, they wanted more ground movement data. They wanted sections on rock, so expanding again, all the time expanding the coverage of these documents, right from clay only to competent ground to include rock. And people want an index, apparently it helps uh, in usability. Okay, this is just uh, just to give you a bit of an idea of some of the feedback we got from the questionnaire. There was a couple of questions which, because when they made when they first wrote C580, they also did a questionnaire to industry, um, and we duplicated some of those questions just to see how things have changed. So in 2001, they asked these questions when writing 580, and the question was: Is the guidance provided in current design guides and codes of practice clear and unambiguous? So in 2001, 14% said yes and 86% said no. And by 2014, this had become close to 50-50. So that's a massive improvement, as you can imagine, and I think C580 had some part to play in, in that improvement in understanding uh, of uh, design guides. So the reason for no were a few, but uh, people had issues with EC7, it wasn't clear how to use it, it was unclear how to apply partial factors, and there was not enough selection, uh, guidance on selection of parameters, temporary works, and water pressures. The next question was, does the guidance provided in current codes of practice result in the economic design and construction of embedded walls? So again, in 2001, it was one third to two thirds, roughly, said yes. So disappointing when you think uh, that's people's opinion. And by 2014, when Eurocode 7 was in place, that numbers had flipped around. And I don't know what the perception is here, but my understanding in the UK is that uh, people don't think that EC7 results in economic designs particularly. So was, this came as a real surprise to us. Here's just some, uh, some photos and some notes from the industry consultation. As I said, we had 40 over, uh, over 50 attendees from a broad range of background, and they were broken out into 10 groups helped by facilitators to report back the discussions. Okay, so the areas identified development. These graphs which show movements uh, due to installation effects of walls and also excavation of walls have become the un unexpected uh, hit of uh, C580 and probably the most used and abused part of the existing document, but people wanted more. Um, as I said, they wanted it to be Eurocode 7 compliance. They wanted more guidance on the use of uh, FE in uh, routine design, both 2D FE and 3D FE. As I said, they wanted guidance on weak rocks and soft soils to, uh, to complete, if you like, the coverage of the, uh, the document. Um, wanted guidance on the interpretation of design combinations. How do you do design approach one? Combination one, combination two, if you'll get on to. How do you choose your five value for granular materials or drain parameters? Um, is there any role for statistics in choosing characteristic? Use of wall friction, uh, de determination of water pressures, linking EC7 to EC2 and EC3. And with the audience today, part of the ice jockey is uh, it's great to have that show that link and numerical modelling, as I said. So, moving on to the document. Starting with design by calculation. 
which might be a strange phrase for some people, but it basically means you do your design in a spreadsheet or a piece of software or something based on theoretical parameters. So there's a few parts of this presentation where I have to read clauses from Eurocode 7, for which I can only apologize, but it's uh, kind of necessary when, uh, when doing this type of work. But clause 2.1 part four permits design of geotechnical structures to be undertaken by calculation, which I said is probably the thing we're most familiar with, the most comfortable with. It's what we learn at university at the end of the day. By prescriptive measures, that essentially means looking up things in the table, using conservative relationships uh, for very simple structures, not very common in my experience for, or not allowed for geotechnical uh, category two or three structures. Experimental models and low tests, obviously these have got a, a large part to play in sort of foundation design, but not so much uh, embedded retaining walls. And the fourth one is the observational method. And I quite deliberately put the, the guy with his fingers crossed because people's perception of the OM is that it's higher risk and uh, sort of slightly dubious and should be approached at, you know, with all caution. Um, as I said earlier, that's one of the things that we really want to debunk and uh, we'll come on to that in the next part. But starting with design by calculation, the things I want to talk about are the limit states that you need to consider when doing design by calculation how you apply design approach one. I won't go into two and three, I'm sorry, I basically don't know about it, but I'm um, hoping open to discussion. Um, how you apply partial factors in design approach one. Some parameters, some, some discussion about parameter selection, and then some additional design considerations at the end. So section 2.4.7 of Eurico 7, requires you to consider the ultimate limit state. And it tells you that the ultimate limit state is about safety, about uh, the safety of people and of structures. And you have to consider EQ, which is loss of uh, equilibrium, STRA, which is a sort of structural failure, and GEO, which is failure through ex excessive deformation of the ground. Um, next section, 2.4.8, tells you you have to consider the serviceability limit state, which is not about safety, necessarily. It's about function, it's about comfort or appearance of a retaining wall. And just to illustrate the point, the, uh, the ultimate limit stage you can see here is a failure of a, of a gravity retaining wall in the Swiss Alps following snow. You can see that it's completely failed and somebody could have been hurt if, if they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And of course the most, one of the most famous geotechnical ultimate limit stage failures would be the nickel highway collapse in, uh, in Singapore. Serviceability, on the other hand, is not about absolute failure. It's about appearance or function. So you can see that this rather simple uh, garden retaining wall is st stable, if you like. It's standing up. It's still doing its job, but it looks pretty awful. And uh, it's probably not, uh, not, not serviceable function from a serviceability point of view. So the serviceability could be of the wall itself, as shown there or it could be of neighboring structures. And again, the structure is uh, stable. You could be in it, it's not, going to, it's not uh, going to harm anybody, but the guy standing there with his cowboy hat on is probably not very happy with those cracks appearing in his, uh, in his house wall. So, as I said, the UK adopted design approach one, and it requires two checks on ultimate limit states. It's combination one, so design approach one, combination one, where partial factors greater than one are applied to actions or the effects of actions. And combination two, where partial factors greater than one are applied to soil and rock parameters. Now, one of the common misunderstandings that we found during the process of writing the document is that people had different opinions on what combination one and combination two represented. Some people felt that combination one was essentially an SLS check because there's no partial factors on soil, and, SL and combination two was a ULS check, or that combination one was a structural check, structural ULS check, and combination two was a geo check. But neither of these views are correct in accordance with the code at least. They are both ULS checks, and they are both struct slash geo checks. So if you have to do an SLS check, you have to do it separately. I will accept that combination one is extremely similar 
to uh, an SLS check, but there are subtle differences. And if you want to be precise about it, you do need to do a separate SLS check. So these are the, um, the partial factors that we talked about. You can see that in combination one, um, all the factors are, are one or unity on uh, soil and rock parameters. And then you need to apply a factor of 1.35 to permanent loads and 1.5 on variable loads. And I think when Eurocode 7 came out initially, it was ex people found it extremely difficult to understand how they could apply uh, partial factors to loading on a wall. Because at the end of the day, the same soil that's pushing the wall on the active side is probably the same soil that's resisting it on the passive side. So what should I do? Should I apply 1.35 to the unit weight of the soil in the back? Then if I apply 1.35 to the passive side, that's non-conservative. Or do I just multiply the force by one, or the pressures by 1.35? So I think this, we found that this created quite a lot of confusion at the beginning. So, as I said, is, is, there's, this, this is resolved generally in something in Eurico 7 called the single source theorem that says if you have the same um, action, destabling and stabilizing, you can apply the partial factors to the effect of the action rather than to the action itself. And this is what we have found became common approach in the UK at least to deal with design approach one and combination two. So this is a figure from the report. And you can see on design approach one, you have um, partial factor of 1.35 applied to the effect of the action rather than to the action itself. And that gets around this single source problem. So you apply 1.35 to bending moments, shear forces, and any prop forces. Now there's a little trick you need to do to make sure you don't double count anything. If you've got a surcharge on the back of the wall, which is a live variable load, let's say, instead of applying a factor of 1.5 to that variable load, you apply a factor of 1.11. And that's because if you apply 1.5 and then multiply by the effect of the action, you're double counting. So the 1.11, as you can see here, is essentially 1.5 divided by 1.35. So it's just, a, it's just a small change to the approach just to make sure you don't double count the partial factors on surcharges. Um, and then design approach one, combination two, is a little bit more straightforward, a bit more easy to do. You just divide your um, characteristic values by factors of 1.25 for effective stress parameters and 1.4 on total stress parameters. But picked out a word there which is uh, very important which is uh, characteristic so all of your design has to come from using characteristic parameters and again this is something else that when Euro Code 7 came out caused massive confusion because somebody thought it, everybody thought it was something new that it, they had to maybe go back to school and learn uh, more statistics to be able to derive this uh, characteristic value so what is it if you read clause 2.4.5.2 it states characteristic value of a geotechnical parameter shall be selected as a cautious estimate of the value affecting the occurrence of the limit state. Now I don't know about you but when I was started out at work I, I don't think I examined this document in as much detail as I did when I was writing this guide and I had started to read that and I had no clue what it was actually trying to tell me. So what does it mean affecting the occurrence of the limit state and does statistics have a role? Because that's the other thing that tended to happen. People thought they had to do statistics on their parameters to get, to get uh, characteristic. And is it any different to any of the values we used to use? So is it different to the values in R104, BSA002, or C580, or any other design guidance you can think of? So what does the value affecting the occurrence of the limit state actually mean? If we think about two examples, I think it becomes a bit clear what the code authors were thinking of. If you think about an embedded retaining wall of the ULS as opposed to an end bearing pile at ULS. Now, when the embedded retaining wall fails on along that slip surface, you can see it's a large area. The, the, the friction mobilizes over a large area. So you can say that over that large area, small variations in the parameters, uh, natural variations, will be evened out. So the characteristic value for the failure on that surface could be close to the average because it's being averaged out over the distance. However, if you think about an end bearing pile at ULS, all of the stress is concentrated at one point at the end of the pile. So in that case, the local variations in the strength parameters could have huge differences to the, uh, to the behavior. So if you had 
typical geotechnical sort of measles plot of strength with depth. The retaining wall, you might feel comfortable taking a cautious estimate of the mean for the, uh, for the design of the retaining wall. But if you look at the end bearing problem, it could be there, for example, you've got a, quite a range of parameters. So your characteristic value for the, for the end bearing path could be different to the retaining wall. So that's the point, is that um, characteristic is not a best estimate or a statistical mean, but it's a function of the problem being considered. And that's why that clause in the code was written the way it was. So previous guides, as I said earlier, used different phrases. There was, uh, people have talked about cautious estimate of the mean, moderately conservative. This was in C104 and in C580 and representative values were used in BSA002. And this, again, as I said, caused people some consternation as they thought, what are all these things? Are they any different? And we took the view with the guide, with the uh, project steering group, that just to clear up, these are, should all be treated as the same, and in Eurocode 7 speak, they're characteristic. So picking up the next point, is there a role for statistics? And again, reading the code, it says, if statistical methods are used, the characteristic value should be derived such that the calculated probability of a worse value governing the occurrence of the limit state under consideration is not greater than 5%. So what does that mean? We came up with two different interpretations of what that meant. The first one was the combination of all the characteristic variables resulting in 95% confidence or we have to choose parameters which have a 95% confidence. And it's this second interpretation which caused the most consternation. So everybody thought, I used to go for just below the mean, now I've got to go for 95% confidence limit. This is gonna result in much more conservative retaining walls. So again, through the project steering group and through discussions <coughs> with the code drafters, we discussed this at quite some length and we've, we agreed that it was definitely the former but then that raises the question, well, how do I do it? How do I achieve 95% confidence with all the characteristic variables in the retaining wall? And the answer was, well, you need a characteristic distribution of water levels, of your surcharge values, of your soil parameters, of your structural properties, you need to, and anything else you can think of, throw them all in a Monte Carlo analysis, and then have a probability distribution of the ULS occurring, and then make sure that you've got 95% confidence. This is an interesting area for research at the moment, but I would be interested if anybody here has attempted to do a Monte Carlo analysis for a retaining wall. So whilst it's interesting, it's not particularly relevant for day-to-day -day practice. So to answer the question, does statistics have a, have a role? Probably not <coughs> in routine design, unless you have a, a huge amount of data and time to, uh, to run this type of uh, scenario analysis. Okay, so just to pick up on a few points uh, also related to design by calculation, the first one being uh, choice of water level. Of course, retaining walls, the choice of the water level is fundamental to the design. It's one of the most important actions on the wall. So some questions to ask yourself, and this is the thought process we went through again with the project steering group, again related to design approach one, is the groundwater the same for combination one and combination two? Should we take account of accidental cases such as a flood or a burst water main in the combination one and two analysis? And should the water levels be the same in the short term and the long term? And in combination one, should we be applying a partial factor of 1.35 to a most onerous water level? So, the common approach we found, again, for people's interpretation of the combination one, combination two, is that in combination one, you should use moderately conservative estimate of normal groundwater conditions, which are then factored by 1.35 in the effects of actions. And in combination two, the worst credible water level would be taken in the short term and the long term. But is this correct? Is it strictly in accordance with what the code says? Well, if you look at the clause again, it says that design value should be represented the most unfavorable values that should occur during the design life of the structure for the ULS case. Well, as we said earlier, combination one and combination two are both ULS cases. 
and they're both struct geo cases, therefore probably the value should be the same in combination one and combination two. It wasn't perhaps common practice at that point. Um, one thing to note that we did pick up, of course, is that Eurocode EC0 allows you to treat accidental cases differently, which is if it's truly accidental, it can be uh, treated with partial factors of unity on all parameters and, and designed as a sort of a, a worst case scenario. So what we put into the document was a proposed flowchart which allows you to choose your water level rationally. And again, we had, the, we had the intention of trying to reward people with good ground investigation data to encourage more ground investigation data. So the first question we had, is there adequate monitoring data available for the ground water level? And if the answer was no to that, well, well beside you, in that case, as a punishment, you need to set, set the design groundwater at the worst credible level. An example would be ground level or for temperate and tropical areas. That's the end of the discussion. If you've got no data and you're not confident in it, you have to take the worst case. If you have got good data, is you have to ask yourself, is there a source for elevated groundwater levels during the construction period? If the answer to that is no, then you can't have the accidental case of it in the short-term period. So you set the design groundwater level as a cautious estimate of the observed values. And this may be a maximum value plus a margin. And we said one or half or one meters, let's say. If you do have a potential uh, source for elevated groundwater during construction, then you can look at the accidental case during the short term and in the long term you can take the worst critical value. So this chart hopefully sets out a way of correctly interpreting the code but not overdoing the accidental water level and also encouraging good ground investigation practice. So choice of phi dashed. Um, we talk about fires if it's one value, but of course it isn't a constant, not even for one material. Um, we normally, there are a whole range of fire values, including the direction of uh, shearing, but they're most commonly we, we, we reduce it down to a peak fire value, a critical state value, and a residual for clays. So the question came about in the discussion, which value should you choose for embedded retaining wall design? If you look in ta uh, table 8.4 for the uh, Eurocode 7, it says gamma phi should be 1.25 for combination 2. And note this factor is applied <coughs> to tan phi. So it doesn't make any differentiation between any of the different phi values. And so it suggests that if you read it literally, that you should apply a factor of 1.25 to tan phi CV, the tan phi residual, which seemed to us to be a little bit overcautious as these are all already worst credible parameters. Um, if you look in the UK National Annex of the same document, it says... Um, the 1.25 should be applied to tan phi or tan phi CV, although it may be more appropriate to determine the design value of phi CV directly. And again, wondered what that actually meant. But what it is was the it's Andrew Bond who was writing the UK National Annex, trying to allow us to a set partial factor of phi CV of unity in that case. But you wouldn't know that from reading the uh, reading the text. So after discussion with the the authors of the updated BS, we agreed that we could set some refinement to the gamma phi, 1.25 as per Eurocode 7 for peak values, and then unity for CV and residual. And hopefully that will lead to some economies. So wall friction. This is uh, quite um, commonly misunderstood. There's uh, two possible s situations. One where the uh, retaining wall is also just acting as a retaining wall, just as a retaining wall. You can see that there's friction on the back of the wall as the, uh, the soil block of soil sl tries to slip behind the wall. And we get, uh, if we have, if we assume friction on the back of the wall, it's our friend, it's, you know, we like it in design because it um, reduces Ka. <coughs> and the block of wall, soil in front of the wall moving in the opposite direction, again, if we assume friction, it's our friend because it increases Kp, so it's sort of a double a double win for the designer if you assume friction. However, there is an extra ca complication when the same retaining wall is acting as a foundation. So as soon as you put a, an axial load on top of the wall, you've got friction trying to act in the opposite direction to the, uh, the, s the friction when it acts like a, re uh, a retaining wall. And there's a, as you can see, there's a um, disagreement there in the shear friction directions. So if you take benefit of friction to reduce your active pressures, but then you also take benefit of friction to resist 
axial loads, you're making a, a contradictory assumption which is possibly non-conservative. So I won't go through the situation, but the document goes into quite some detail about covering some typical details of how to deal with that when, uh, when the wall is just acting as a, as a wall, not part of a foundation system, when it's acting as a, a retaining wall and a foundation in the long term, and um, finally, when it's in sort of a top-down construction sequence, when it's acting as a foundation in the short term and the long term. And the, in, the, in a nutshell, the guidance is suggesting that um, in this zone here, where we had that discrepancy in the assumed friction directions, you should assume no friction at all. So no friction for the foundation and no friction for the uh, reducing KA. Yeah. Now, again, this can all be dealt with if you do a soil structure interaction analysis with a finite element program or something like that. But when you're using simplified programs, this is uh, the recommendation. So finally, over excavation. The clause in Eurocode 7 states that you should allow for half a meter of accidental over excavation or 10% of the total height limited to half a meter and then there's a there's a little get out clause there which has been used quite a lot which is that this over dig may be reduced to zero if adequate engineering supervision is specified and since people spotted that clause in the document every design I've ever seen has always had adequate engineering supervision and zero accidental over excavation and as a group, we felt zero is extremely hard to achieve. Um, and so we actually suggested that even with the best endeavors, the accidental overdig should be a minimum of, of uh, 0.1 meters. So that's, that's more conservative than what's in the Eurocode. So we talked about limit states to consider, which are the ULS and the SLS. We talked about design approach one, how to apply the partial factors and how these apply to embedded retaining walls, particularly how we get around the single source problem where we have the same thing destabilizing the wall and stabilizing it. We talked about how to choose statistical parameters. It's important to remember it's applicable to the occurrence of the limit state under consideration. So it's not necessarily the same value, even in the same ground for different types of structures. Um, and then we just covered those four <coughs> design considerations which are picked up in the document, which is choosing your design water level, choice of phi, wall friction, and over excavation. So that's design by calculation. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the observational method. And uh, as I said, it's the fourth option which is given in Eurocode 7 for designing geotechnical structures. And um, it has quite a long history. Um, I'll, I will read it out. This is, uh, this is a Syria, another Syria guidance called C185, and it was written by a colleague of mine, Duncan Nicholson from Arup in London. And it describes the observational method as the observational method in ground engineering is a continuous, managed, integrated process of design, construction control, monitoring and review that enables previously defined modifications to be incorporated during or after construction as appropriate. The objective is to achieve greater overall economy without compromising safety. The method can be adopted from the inception of a project or later if benefits are identified. So there's some really key phrases in there. One of them is it's a continuous managed integrated process of design. So it's design, it's very important to remember that. Um, and you want to achieve economy without compromising safety. So all these things are very important. Before we go into a bit of detail, I'd just like to touch on um, some definitions. So having said that statistics probably don't have a role at the moment, have to remember a little bit of statistical terms as we go into the observational method. Um, most probable is uh, in the normal distribution as shown there, it's smack dead in the middle. You've got a 50-50 chance of, of being higher or lower than that point. And the reason we don't choose most probable for our designs is because our clients won't thank us if they've got a 50% chance of failure or not. So what we choose is characteristic, which is just to the left of uh, most probable. How far to the left, as we saw earlier, is dependent upon the problem, but it's definitely to the left. Um, and some people play around with phrases like worst credible, which somewhere down the tail end to the left. So bearing those uh, terms in mind, we we'll focus on characteristic and most probable in the observational method. Um, 
And as a geotechnical engineer, it's very, very tempting to think that everything is related to the ground. But unfortunately, there is uncertainty in other areas of, uh, of engineering as well. So your, your characteristic or your most probable parameters are not necessarily just soil behavior. They can be stratigraphy and, and, uh, and things like that, but also structural behavior, um, construction use, construction tolerances, and also site use. So we'll talk mainly about geotechnics here, but uh, of course, it's not limited to just that. So just um, for interest, if you look at chapter eight of C580, which is titled Areas of Further Work and Research, this is 2003, don't forget, it states that significant cost savings can be achieved by adopting a risk-based approach to design and construction through the use of the observational method. So since 2003, which is when I finished my PhD, I haven't seen an enormous adoption of the observational method. So in that sense, C580 kind of failed because it has not led to the, uh, the widespread use of it. So if you go back a little bit to 1969, the first mention of the observational method was given by Peck in his Rankin lecture. Of course, it goes back way, way before that as well. It's not prehistoric times. People would uh, apply the observational method to any construction. They would put up a, 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 an arch or a bridge, and then they would fall down. They'd observe that, then they would change their construction and do it again until it didn't fall down. Uh, that sort of approach is not, no longer acceptable, so we have to apply some science to it. But in, uh, in, Rank in uh, Peck's Rankin lecture in 1969, he defined a term ab initio. And for all the Latin scholars in the room, ab initio means from the start. And he um, defined ab initio as being the observational method applied to construction before construction starts. And that's the important thing. And he identified that it could maximize the possible savings because he, he'd assume most probable <coughs> behavior. So he would go smack in the middle of that probability curve, say most probable, I've got 50-50 chance of being right. But he also defined another term in the observational method, which he called, he dropped the Latin for this one, he went for best way out. So that's essentially when the OM is applied during construction. So the intention was not to use the OM, but something went wrong, something unexpected happened, and some, meth some uh, mitigation needs to be uh, applied to prevent failure from happening. And so this goes back to 1969 in Peck's Rankin Lecture. So remember those terms ab initio and best way out. So going back to the Siri report, C185 from 1999 by Nicholson et al., they also used the term ab initio, but changed the definition of it somewhat. So instead of going most probable parameters, this document started with characteristic. So you started with a characteristic design, um, which would be compliant, let's say, with the um, design by calculation approach we talked about earlier. And then through progressive modification and observations, if behavior was tending towards most probable, you could start changing your construction sequence or things like that to make savings in program or materials. So it was like PEC, but subtly different in the PEC started from most probable, uh, whereas uh, the Siri report started from characteristic. And there's no guidance on the best way out. So what did the Eurocode 7 say about it? Well, it's the first code, I'm aware of at least in the UK, that covered the observational method. Um, but does it really cover it adequately? Well, if there are 12 pages in Eurocode 7, in the base document, which describe design by calculation. And there are 221 words on the observational method. So you can see that it doesn't quite have the same significance as design by calculation, or the same amount of guidance as design by calculation. So what are the benefits of the observational method? Well, this is a figure taken directly from the, uh, the Syria report. You can pick out the really important phrases such as improved safety control. It's not more dangerous, it's more safe because people are looking at the data continuously and comparing it to predictions to see how it's progressing. There is control of design uncertainties. Rather than hiding them behind large factors or conservative assumptions, they're up front. There's greater connection between designers and contractors, improved construction control and management, greater motivation for the project team, it useful for providing database for benchmarking, and all these things are aimed at achieving greater value in economy. Um, one, one thing I will just say before we go on, and it's, and it's related specifically to embedded retaining walls, and it's a bit obvious, but you have to bear it in mind, is that 
once you've installed the wall, an embedded retaining wall, you can't change it very easily. So in terms of um, applying progressive modifications during construction, you can't change the wall. You can only change the construction sequence or the things supporting uh, the wall. So that's important when you consider which uh, approach to adopt. So what did we do? Well, while we, while we were drafting C760, we came up with a whole new framework. It's nothing new particularly in the application, but it's a new framework which hopefully um, provides clarity for people for the application of the OM. So we started off with ab initio <coughs> in, in accordance with, um, with PEC, and we defined two different approaches ab initio. One we called optimistic, which is where you planned your construction sequence assuming <coughs> most probable parameters, so somewhere in the middle of that uh, probability distribution. But you had in your back pocket all the time a contingency which allowed the wall to be stable um, if performance was tending towards a characteristic. So this was consistent with how Peck defined ab initio in 1969. The second category we called ab initio cautious and this was flipped around so you started your construction with characteristic assumptions so a design that's in accordance with design by calculation requirements but you had in your pocket from predefined steps possible modifications if performance was tending towards most probable and this was in accordance with ab initio from the Syria report. So we needed a second category so not, not to be left out we uh, opened our Latin uh, alphabets and so we had ab initio which is from the start but we wanted another one which was to say making changes during construction and so you know not being too pretentious we had uh, ipso tempore which essentially means in the moment okay so this is a second category the observational method ipso tempore in the moment and again we had two subclasses of this first one is proactive so this is probably the most common approach for the observation method and it was it was adopted several times on um, Crossrail in London to make savings in, in program and cost and so this is where you start off with a wall which is designed by calculation things are going along nicely you've got inclinometers or something in your wall and your client contractor says to you your predictions are massively over the top they're too conservative do we really need that last level of prop I want to get on and you back analyze the wall and you say well actually things are going really well I've recalibrated my model and I think we can do without it so that is ipso tempore proactive that's when things are going well second category is reactive and this is when things are going badly and movements are unexpected either of the wall itself or of something around the wall and you need to apply some contingency to stop things getting out of control or becoming unacceptable and that last category is exactly how Peck describes the best way out. But the interesting thing is that that category here, the third one, despite being probably the most commonly applied approach to the observation method, has never been previously defined or had a name. So we hope with this framework people can understand how ab initio is compared to ipso tempore. So we'll go through a few examples now just to drive home the uh, the approach on how to how to use ab initio and ipso tempore. Um, I'll just go through sort of some idealized examples, and one which is optimistic approach, and the second one which is cautious, and two scenarios for each: one where things are going well, and one things are going badly. So in scenario one: optimistic, no contingency is needed, and scenario two: contingency is needed. Of course, these are simplified to make it clear, and nothing's ever as nice in reality. Um, but if you start off with ab initio optimistic, our starting design, if you remember, was most probable parameters. So because we've been really, really optimistic, we've minimized our wall depth and our reinforcement, which as I said earlier, can't be changed once it's installed. And the starting design is one top prop and five meters of embedment, let's say. Now our alternative design, which relies on characteristic parameters, it's an alternative construction sequence and it includes the top prop but also requires sort of sequential excavation using bay and berms and of course the embedment has to be five meters because that's what I've already got I can't change that 
So that's my alternative. That's if things are going well. So there's a simplified graph here showing um, the traditional red, amber, green trigger levels and construction stages along the bottom. And then on the, on the, on the y-axis is some parameter that you've chosen to monitor and to set your triggers against. That could be wall movement, it could be prop force, it could be anything. And the boundary between your, in this case, the boundary between your green trigger and your amber trigger is the most probable line. And the boundary between the amber and the, the red is a characteristic line. So in stage one, we excavate an initial cantilever and the movement or whatever is in the, in, the, uh, in the green area. And then we install our prop and excavate some more and we're still within the green area. We excavate further, we're still within the green area. And then we get to the formation level and we're still in the green area. So because all of those movements are below the most probable predictions, things are in accordance with the most probable design. So everything was great. We managed to ma maximize the savings for our client by doing a most probable design and keeping it, uh, and keeping it safe. In scenario two, so exactly the same wall, exactly the same sequence. We do initial excavation, everything's in green. We then excavate further, install the prop, but our movements have gone over the most probable and into the red zone above characteristic. So at that point, we know that the ground is not behaving in accordance with our most probable approach and is actually closer to the characteristic. So at that point, we have to take action and, you, and uh, apply our contingency, which is pre-planned already in the back of our pocket, and start excavating bays and berms and installing the base slab before completing excavation. And everything's happy. So you see, the behavior was different, so we applied our contingency and we didn't make the massive savings we promised our client because we had to do the bay and berms, things were a bit slower but at least the wall didn't fall down. So if we take, that was the ab initio optimistic, if we take the cautious approach, our starting design, this time the starting design is characteristic parameters. And if you like, the design is completely compliant with design by calculation. And the design is, requires two props and six and a half meters of embedment. Our alternative design adopts most probable parameters and the alternative construction sequence is we don't install the bottom level of props. Now at this point, we don't have those big savings we had in the previous example because A, you're probably gonna have to have those props ready because you won't know until the last minute whether or not you need them. And, uh, and second of all, your wall is already installed with the, the, le the toe length and the reinforcement that you installed. So the real only savings that you'll get in the alternative design is program savings, which of course are big, but they're not the, they're not the full savings you had in the previous example. So again, going through the same stages for scenario one, we do an initial excavation, everything's in green. We then do further excavation, install the prop, everything's in green. Look at the observations in its decision time. At that point, do we need a second prop? Well, the most probable design said that we didn't need the second prop, and all of our movements are within the most, below the most probable line, so the decision in this case is that we don't need it. So we carry on with our modification, which is not installing the prop. We complete excavation and complete the structure all within the, below the most probable line. In scenario two, we do the same things. And this time, at decision time, the movements are between most probable and characteristic. So at this point, we have to decide, well, the characteristic design said we needed two levels of prop. The most probable said we needed one level. So because we're between the two, we definitely need a second level. So we install our format second level and continue to formation. So everything's saved, but we haven't saved that program saving that we uh, offered to our client. So just going through that again, the ab initio, Framework from C760 means from the start we have two approaches, optimistic and cautious. 
The important thing is they both start before construction, hence the, hence the name. Um, one, the optimistic starts from most probable with a contingency plan based on characteristic, and the cautious starts with characteristic and has a modification plan based on um, characteristic. Uh, most probable. So you're wondering to yourself, what would govern your choice between optimistic and cautious? Well, it has to be the familiarity with the ground conditions. That goes for the designer and the contractor and the availability of documented case histories. I don't think you'd want to go for optimistic in a place you've never worked before where nobody's ever built an embedded retaining wall or, or instrumented it. Um, the contractor environment, it's a, it's, a, it's a reality that if uh, the contractor if, if you're in a DMB scenario where the client is uh, potentially going to say make massive significant savings from uh, making changes that could encourage them and everybody at the end of the day has a different appetite for risk and that's the designer and the contractor so it's a personal choice how you feel about going for optimistic or cautious so the second category is the ipso tempore I won't go through this in great detail so it's a bit more intuitive but you essentially start out with a standard design by calculation, no intention at all to apply the observational method. Construction begins. This is the proactive, of course. The movements are found to be smaller than expected. The project team decide together to initiate the observational method. At that stage, you back analyze the movements using your, whatever software you're using. And then you derive a new set of recalibrated parameters based on your observations. You can then use those recalibrated parameters to forward predict to the end of the construction sequence and apply any modifications you want. And then you apply the new construction sequence. But of course, once you've done that, you then continue to monitor and you continue to back analyze at each construction stage to make sure things are indeed going according to plan. And if they start to go awry with your new construction sequence, you may want to sort of revert back to your ori original. So that's proactive. Um, reactive is very similar, but of course, it's not such a happy story as you're probably trying to prevent a ULS or an SLS failure rather than trying to uh, make improvements. So essentially, movements or something is observed to be greater than expected. You recalibrate your parameters and behavior. You plan your contingency measures, which may, for example, be extra popping. And you redefine your limits based on the calibrated model and implement the contingency plan. Okay, so that's the end of the, uh, the observational method. I'd just like to briefly touch on some other significant developments which are in the, uh, the document. And these are derivation of parameters for weak rocks, the ground movement database, choice of wall type and typical structural details, guidance on use of the final element analysis, which of course is much more common now in 2017 or 2020 than it was in 2003 when the original guidance was uh, published. Structural design with the wall and support system and something on the uh, crack width. So the original document, as we said, didn't touch on rock at all. Uh, we did check with the, um, through the questionnaire how people deal with rocks and there seem to be two methods generally for uh, designing embedded retaining walls. The first is the um, choice of the hook brown criteria, which is of course designed specifically for rocks and gives you a, uh, a non-linear uh, failure surface. Um, not all software of course has this implemented, so what is quite common we found is that people back figure more Coulomb parameters to an equivalent hook brown failure surface. So there is guidance in the document about how to go about doing that. Mathematically it's quite laborious, so there are software available for it as well, but at least it's all set out there. And there's also guidance on K0 which I don't think anybody's particularly reliably measured K0 in rocks, but uh, we suggest taking the value of one, but we know that because it's so stiff, it will rapidly drop down to active values. The ground movement database has been extended. It's been extended significantly for the uh, case histories in soft soils. So you have ground movements for retaining wood behind soft soils, which are of course much, much more than the existing database presented for stiff soils. Um, I'd like to say there's lots more data for the movement and installation effects in, in stiff clays, but despite sending over 2,000 requests to industry, we had about three or four extra case histories to add, which is uh, a shame. And uh, just, just expanding briefly on that, 
question of that database, um, again, going back to that chapter eight of C580, which is areas for further work, it stated there is an urgent requirement for more case history data to provide high quality measurements for the actual behavior of different types of retaining walls installed in the range of ground conditions. And one of, as I said, our questionnaires were sent out to well over a thousand people and we received five additional case histories. So that's a telling off, not necessarily to you guys, but to uh, <laughs> the people in the UK. There's uh, additional guidance on the choice of wall types, and that uh, gives updated on movement tolerances because piling rigs, of course, have moved on since 2003 as well. And uh, Dimitris Salavitis introduced these things called nomograms into the document, which um, allows you to set the spacing of your secant and contiguous uh, sorry secant piled walls um, based on the spacings and the, uh, the the construction tolerances to make sure you have interlock at formation level. And it's a, it's a graphical way of doing it, which allows you to draw on the formation level, for example, here, and then you choose where you want your interlock to go, to in this case 7.5 meters. You draw a line across to these graphs, and you choose your secondary diameter of your pile, in this case 900 millimeters, join the two up, and it tells you what your secondary spacing of the, the piling, your, sorry, the spacing of your secondary pile should be, and also what the primary cut into each pile is. So it's a very useful quick check on the geometry of laying out secant piles. Um, there's a little bit of uh, discussion on the uh, use of geothermal piles um, and the embedded carbon in, uh, in typical concrete piles and details on guide wall details and connection details into slabs and, and uh, what have you. As I said, there is some gui extra guidance on the use of finer element analysis. There's a fully worked example in the appendix uh, which uses the obligatory, I'm afraid, plaxis to do, um, uh, to do the embedded retaining wall design in accordance with combination two. Um, there is a discussion in that chapter on the applicability of ground movement predictions that come from these types of uh, calculations because it's all too tempting to use the retaining wall designed from Plaxis with a linear elastic, perfectly plastic model and believe the, the movements that come out of it. So there's a large health warning against that. Um, in terms of structural design, there's uh, alignment in the document now between EC2, EC three and seven, uh, guidance on prop design from BS8002 and anchor design in accordance with BS8081. So that's the end of the main part of the presentation. Have time. Um, I have to say that updating C580 was a, was a daunting but uh, necessary task. It was obviously a much loved document and much used as we saw earlier all around the world and it was came defining really in terms of its clarity on how to design embedded retaining walls. Um, we went through the Eurocode 7 design and how to go about that. It's, it's quite uh, ironic really that We've updated, we've produced 760 to give guidance on Eurocode 7 design just at the time when we're about to update it again. But uh, anyway, I guess that's just an opportunity to uh, write another version in a few years' time. But we went through how to do calculation by design, um, including the, the, the points listed there. Um, but I think most importantly, in terms of uh, moving things on, a whole new framework for the application of the observational method as we want to really re reignite the use of this uh, in the industry and uh, the new framework includes two categories ab initio and ipso tempore so that's from before construction begins and during construction and we touched on uh, these other significant developments such as the design parameters for weak rock and uh, updated ground movements so I'd like to thank you all for your attention um, happy to take any questions for the floor. A very simple one. Um, just on the, you mentioned the adequate groundwater mm. monitoring. Um, is that just simply what we normally have as a ground investigation, which would have us have a um, borehole with a standpipe for yeah. three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, whatever? Is that adequate groundwater monitoring? It might be longer if it's tidal. Yes, there's there's a bit of th there's a bit of text in the document about that. So I mean, we know the. Uh, the reality of ground investigations is that you don't get 12 months of data showing you the full seasonal fluctuation. I think the point is, does it cover the area adequately? Do you have enough points around the site to give you any variation across the site? Are the, are the installations appropriate to the ground conditions? 
Um, if you're trying to put standpipes in clay, for example, you know, I don't know if you, uh, that's common, but in, when I see that in UK, I go mad because you know the, the equalization time is going to be more than you'll ever have. And uh, I think the fundamental question is, is it, are, the, are your findings consistent with your understandings of the hydrology of the site? I think if you've got those things and you're, and, and you're confident, yes, I'd say it's adequate. You don't want to be too prescriptive, but... Uh, yeah, Jim. <laughs> When, when you discuss the relation of the parameters, especially the, the grain angle of friction, the retaining wall when you compare with the roofing unit space is higher. Yeah. We've, we've done some work on, on the failure of those retaining walls, and we've actually found that the spatial variability of the property it, it is quite significant when you start doing the run investigation, but did you mention that you could kind of average the angle of friction uh, for the retaining structure? Well, I mean, it wasn't necessarily the angle of friction. I think it was any any parameter, but yes, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you have a layering that is quite yeah. different, would, would, would you average per layer or would you average the entire? No, I think it would be within each stratum. I, th I don't think you can average over the whole over the whole thing. The point was that I wouldn't recommend an average as such. I just think it's tending more to be average, <laughs> if that makes sense. If you remember the distribution curve, you can head a little bit closer to the peak mm -hmm. than you would if you were looking at a localized failure like an end bearing pile. So closer to the average, and yeah, within a stratum. I mean, these these examples are always very simplified to make the point, but yeah, you, I think you'd limit it to each each stratum. <laughs> Which, uh, as we mentioned in the introduction, I'm working on uh, high speed two, and uh, in our in our tender, we went mad for observational method because we we're like, yeah, we'll bring it in and we'll save loads. Unfortunately, on our package, there's so few opportunities. Um, I can't put my hand on my heart and say we have no, but there's a lot of talk. The guys who've been uh, in the various Euro seven committees will say that there's been a much more discussion in the next version of Eurocode 7 to we'll try and promote it a bit more but I can't say we have no <laughs> yep. so again on the observational method do you think that um, some of the reluctance goes back to the NAGM failures um, I mean the observational method is very common in tunneling generally, especially uh, mining works, I think. Um, I don't know what it comes to. I think there's a few things. I think there's a misunderstanding about the risk. I think people view it as risky, and I think it's the exact opposite. I think there's also a reluctance for clients to want to keep designers on any longer than they necessarily have to. So they'd rather just get a fire and forget type of design. It just goes out in a drawer in, someone goes and builds it and never want to hear about it again. Whereas the, the critical to the success of the OM is the continued involvement of the designer throughout construction, uh, feeding back observations, comparing to predictions, you know, these sort of things. So I think it's misunderstanding and probably reluctance by clients are the biggest obstacles. But maybe, maybe Nathan as well. Showed us how you got from C580 to C760. Were there any parts that you wish you had more time to work on, and what would be, say, when we get to C1000, what would be the most important parts that you would like to change? Um, yeah, just to say, we, we were offered C58 as a document number, and we said, no, 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 no. we want a round number, we want, mm. uh, we want 760. Um, what will be next? Well, the next one will be the new version of Eurocode, I suppose. That's the main thing. Um, I would like there to be less on, I don't know, this is where I'm going to get shot down now, less on limit equilibrium techniques <laughs> for routine design and more on soil structure interaction analysis and design. Um, I would have liked to have taken out the, the lines from the movement graphs because then they become gospel and everyone just applies them religiously, even in completely inappropriate places and there was, there's another section of the industry who criticized them as being too conservative which is 
hilarious because they're just date they're just the data how can they be too conservative they're just used in the wrong way um but anyway yeah that kind of <laughs> rant, rant over sorry There's, there's a similar coverage to what's in 580, which is a background on the burden, the damage, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's uh, the, the damage assessment of other things, more complicated things, a bit beyond this, this document. But I'm actually on the steering, I'm actually on the project steering group for a new series of guidance on doing damage assessments of buildings, more complicated buildings, framed buildings, buildings with deep foundations and that sort of thing. And that should be published by I think autumn time, something like that. So yeah, keep your eyes open for that. No, there's isn't a number yet. There's a name which I can't remember, but I can share. I can share it around. It's being written by Bureau Happold. Yeah. Unfortunately, we lost that one. Well, I think we'd all be interested <laughs> in that one. Yeah, I wonder how could we, I hope no doubt we'll see we'll see it publicised in publications, whether it's something that will. Yes. Yes. I think I think it's summer, summertime, autumn, something like that this year. I mean, it's in the third of four drafts at the moment. So once they've you know once they've gone through their peer review and they've gone through the editorial process and all that kind of thing, should be ready later in the year. say we had Nickel Highway in our mind when we were writing it, to be honest. The problem with Nickel Highway was it was uh, someone fundamentally not understanding soil mechanics and using a new uh, finite element package to do a design. So there isn't a specific reference, no. no. But it's, it's a... It, they, they could, they, you know, I mean, it, it would have been an interesting point to pick up the, the, the dangers of putting in drain soil parameters for soft clays and getting overestimates of um, undrained shear strength in short term analysis. But if you know what I mean, if you go with observation, you've got a full confidence in the data. So mm. it's not so important to GI to a lot of numerical data and case history. Yep. You can obviously sleep a lot easier in terms of you know, how you're supposed to design. I think there's always that worry um, from a design point of view is that how you implement a system on site that, that can recognize the yeah. warning signs and trigger them. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely uh, fully acknowledged that the, the 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 amount of design involvement in the OM is much much higher than for a traditional design. But of course, you know, design engineers are cheap compared to construction, so it should pay for itself many times over. But you do need to design it essentially multiple times. You need to design it for different scenarios, different combinations, different parameters, different assumptions. Um, and, you, and as I said, you have to be involved throughout construction and continuously comparing. Um, yeah. it's, it's just a question of interest. I, I don't fully come in. Uh, that's relevant now, but you mentioned numerous uh, ecosystem <laughs> methods. You know, um, that there was a factor in the C580 of Cockport mm. and the 1.85. A model factor, wasn't it? Yeah, and that reduced down to I think it's 1.25 now. Yeah. Was that based on did someone look, do a whole lot of studies and analysis to compare? Because I mean, I found that to be 1.25 about right, so I was just wondering. Really I think we just felt we'd moved on yeah. and it wasn't necessary anymore. It's a bit like the factoring of soil stiffness. In 580, it tells you to factor your soil stiffness. We decided, again, through consensus, that that just wasn't necessary anymore. So I think the the, the uh, pop forces for Melly was, was one of those as well. We just felt moved on a bit. And there's, there's health warnings about use getting uh, multiple props for Melly or any of these interaction factors and these type of things, severe health warning. 